we've had our imaginations colonized by the idea that church is a building that you go to or going to church means you go to that building, you go on Sunday morning because God doesn't show up fully until Sunday morning at 10 or 11 o'clock. And then God goes home and takes naps after. And it's mostly a spectator sport. It's the Sunday morning, almost a consumer activity. When you are the pastor in these kinds of churches, there's enormous pressure on you to perform, to make a good impression, and to try to keep getting those people in those pews on Sunday morning and putting money in the plate so you can fund the whole thing. And then what happens is the sermon, which is important, we need sermons, but it becomes a sort of pinnacle of everything that happens on Sunday morning. It's all about the sermon. The imagination is not at all engaged what what does it mean to be a community? In fact, the formation of community, which is probably the central thing that people need to be learning how to do in seminary today, that's that's not even in the curriculum for most schools. How do you form a faithful Christian community? Hello and welcome to The Vine. As you may know, our series on John Wesley's five means of grace is in full swing. Recently, we had an opportunity to connect with Dr. Elaine Heath, the author of The Five Means of Grace. Dr. Heath is ordained in the United Methodist Church, served as a professor for 11 years at Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University, and as Dean and Professor of Missional and Pastoral Theology at Duke Divinity School, Duke University. She retired from Duke to lead Neighborhood Seminary, which she co-founded with several friends. It is our prayer that you will be blessed by the wisdom shared by Dr. Heath regarding John Wesley's Five Means of Grace. Hi, Dr. Heath. Hi. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing well. It's the sun's shining and life is good. Well, we are so thrilled that you could take out some time to meet with us today. Thank you so much. We are uh, preaching on your wonderful book for our January series. And we each have taken a chapter to preach on. I've asked the group to ask you one question from the chapter okay. that they've preached on. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the vine and our work that we've been embarking on for the last what, six months or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jefferson, if you'd like to give Dr. Heath some background for us. So the vine is an experiment uh, in some ways of the Tennessee Western Kentucky Conference that came about as we began to experience this affiliation. And our cabinet was discerning how can we help individuals that are losing their physical churches to continue to be connected to one another and for community at large. So we visioned the vine. We had spent the year reading through the gospel of John, the words of Jesus, and I am the vine, you are the branches, really spoke to us. So that we, we launched a new church that has no physical presence other than wherever people are. And the idea for us, our core belief is that one, well, the church is truly the people. Our role as clergy who are journeying with them is to equip them so that they can articulate the good news for themselves and live lives intentionally in relationships with others. So we have begun to develop small groups and, and create small group leaders, take the primary responsibility of gathering people, and they together live uh, the life of faith. One of the things that has been, that we, we talked a lot early on, uh, was uh, very much inspired in uh, the class movement, that we are not trying to necessarily revive the class movement, but we are trying to take the learnings and the core principles from that era and adapt them to where we are today. So that our worship is molded around that. We don't offer a full worship experience online. Uh, we offer a very limited worship experience because we want people to pause and whatever it is their heart feels it's missing that they can add with one another. Uh, so there is no singing. There's a very simple prayer. And we encourage people to kind of stop along the way and interact with one another so that it creates a more natural environment that the, the, they are walking with each other and we are serving primarily as a guide. So over the past six months, we have been figuring out what does that look like in practice? How can we continue to build on, um, on that idea to truly allow 
individuals wherever they find themselves to feel empowered to be translators of the good news of Jesus to others around them. Well, let's jump into the first chapter, prayer. I I really appreciated your kind of thoughtfulness around prayer and what it is and how it's expressed. I loved your story about gazing into the face of Jesus, who gazes back at us with infinite love. I love that. One of the things you note is that you think that many Methodists have a hard time with extemporaneous prayer, or less sort of unscripted prayer. Mm-hmm. And I have experienced that myself. In fact, on my prior church staff, um, we would sit around in our weekly prayer meetings and it, it, when it was time to pray, we'd all say, okay, who's who wants to go? And we it would just be like crickets. Um, and so even among church staff, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> we struggle with this extemporaneous prayer thing. Um, we ended up having a schedule so that there was a rotation that everybody would have a, a week to pray. But one of the things you say is that when we have this mixed misconception that prayer has to be a formal speech, um, you say we miss out on the gift of simple prayer that arises from silent, the silence within. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about our relationship with silence. I wonder how you think that we Methodists might kind of become more comfortable with that kind of silence. And then hopefully that would also lead to being more comfortable with extemporaneous prayer. But I wondered if you might have some thoughts about that. The silence uh, and solitude belong together. Uh, Henry Nouwen has a wonderful book called The Way of the Heart. For anybody that would like to read more about the place of solitude and silence in our spiritual journey, I would recommend that book. The practice of silence is easier for introverts than for extroverts. Let me say that. And sometimes we use that as uh, kind of an excuse, like uh, introverts will be like, yeah, I'm into silence. I'm into centering prayer. I like it because I don't have to talk. You know. <laughs> and then for extroverts, it's painful. But both introverts and extroverts need silence and both introverts and extroverts need expression. So both of those things need to be developed in our prayer life. Silence is really hard for us in our culture. We live in an entertainment culture where we're always listening to something. We always have our earbuds in. There's jibber jabber going on in the TV in the background. And so practicing silence uh, requires discipline for most people. And it means unplugging, putting the device away, finding a space where you can just be quiet. When you begin to develop the practice of silent prayer, most people, which is essential to the contemplative life and to a life where we're keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, you have to have a way to still your soul so that you can actually hear and sense what God is bringing forth. For you, it might not be hearing, so to speak. It might be images or some, you know, awarenesses or whatever. But for most of us, when we start developing a practice of silence, immediately we go to monkey mind, you know, like our mind's chattering. And we remember we, we need to turn the stove on and we forgot we should go trim our toenails. And, you know, it's like <laughs> all this stuff comes to mind. And so learning to just let those things go as they come to mind, to let them go and try to attend to the moment. Many people find it helpful to have a ritual to get started in the silence, such as lighting the prayer candle, sitting in that same chair, having a a clean space in front of us that's not cluttered, maybe closing our eyes or maybe having soft eyes where, you know, our gaze is down and our, our eyes are just barely open. That can be helpful because we want to help our bodies relax into the silence. It's good to start with just five minutes. If you're not used to having silence, start with five minutes. Possibly one of the hardest things about learning silent prayer, this sort of silent gazing or being present to God, is it it feels unproductive to us. So if we're type A personalities, if we're busy bees, you know, for those people, (laughs) the idea of unproductive time feels terribly unproductive. It feels like a waste. But in fact, what we're doing is just spending some time with God without asking for something, without having to tell something, but simply being there with God, being there in the moment. This this practice of being present in the moment is absolutely crucial to living a contemplative life, to having a life of peace. It's crucial to all sorts of related things like learning self-compassion and being present to others instead of our agenda for others and all these things. So this practice of silence, I know I'm going on about a bunch of different things, but I hope you're catching how vital it is to a life of prayer and to a life of service. It seems like it's kind of the foundation for 
yeah. everything else. Right. Yeah, fully listening. I think that that connects with me in the reading the scriptures, uh, searching the scriptures. Very touched by your story uh, about your journey with your mom, true. There's a number of things that really called my attention. You named that, you know, prayer may be the first means of grace. Each means of grace is, is a pathway to know the will of God. It, it seems a very peculiar, given our context, a very peculiar way of explaining what scripture is. Uh, it is really a pathway uh, to knowing the will of God, and it makes it more personal true mm -hmm. it's less a tool for me to use to convince others <laughs> of whatever grand plan than a way that i encounter the divine i'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the role of the scriptures in in the life of the christians and particularly how we united methodists read and encounter the scriptures i, I have found uh, in my life really interesting reading Wesley sermons, how he writes on and on and on and on, uh, coming from one verse. <laughs> and But his sermons are bathed in scriptures, uh, as, as, as you put it in the book. Can you like talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. For Wesley, um, what he would do, he had a very disciplined life, as you know, um, but he traveled 200 and some thousand miles on horseback during his lifetime, you know, doing his ministry. But what he would do is he would have his morning time of prayer and reading the scriptures. He called it searching the scriptures and his his rituals in the morning. Um, and then through the day while he's riding uh, on the horse to go where, wherever he's supposed to go, he would meditate on the scripture that he read that day. And then whatever came forth to him to nourish him, that was the thing that he used to to teach and preach from. So it, there was this extemporaneous quality to how he prepared. If you look carefully at how he defines searching the scriptures, if you you know read his material, it's very similar to what we call Lexio Divina. It's very similar. Uh, he didn't use the phrase Lexio Divina, <laughs> but it's very similar. And he was influenced by some of the Christian mystics, the contemplative traditions that would, uh, that where we get the language Lexio Divina and some of those things. So we actually have in his, in his method of scripture study, it, it connects to the long contemplative traditions of the church. Let me say that as the first piece. Another thing to know about how Wesley read scripture and thought about it was he, he would not have identified with the infallibility view of scripture today. He said that God speaks to us through scripture, so through scripture. So actually, that's pretty progressive. If you can put that idea alongside the sort of infallibility people or the wooden literalism about, you know, if it says six days of creation, that means six 24-hour days. So he wouldn't have had anything to do with that. He also was a scholar, and he read in multiple original languages, you know, sacred texts, and used tools that were available to him in his own day to understand ancient cultures and, you know, sort of the historical critical method hadn't been invented yet. And he would have probably rejected that on some grounds of it not being meant for transformation. Is for him, every, every discipline is, if it's not for transformation so that we can actually be God's love on earth, bringing about transformation in the world, and uh, then we're wasting our time and it's a travesty. So, but he used uh, responsible approaches to the text. Let me say it that way. Reading in the original languages, using whatever tools he had at his uh, disposal around understanding ancient cultures and so on. And then he didn't have that wooden literalist approach to the text. He said, God speaks to us through it, which gives us some latitude in how we uh, interpret scripture. I, I'm looking up because I have a book. Let me just grab it and show it to you that would be helpful to you on this subject. So this one is... Um, Wesley, Wesleyans, and reading Bible as scripture. If you want to, you're recording it so you can get a picture of that later. So this was edited by Joel Green and David Watson. Joel retired recently from Fuller Seminary, and David Watson teaches, and he has an administrative role at United. So these are guys coming from a more evangelical perspective. But they, uh, this is a really good book. It's an anthology. I contributed a chapter myself. Uh, my chapter had to do with... Um, Let's see what the title of it, so I don't get this wrong. Reading Scripture for Christian Formation. So if, if you would like to look at a, a really good survey from a range of scholars who are Methodist, but who have different 
are not all coming from the left or the right or the center. Uh, this is a book that could be helpful in terms of understanding the ways Wesleyans uh, read scripture and um, how it forms us. I loved what you said about the concept of the dinner church in the Lord's Supper mm -hmm. chapter. You said, grace is given to us through sharing food and drink. Christ speaks to us as we talk about how we encounter God in our work, our lives, and our spiritual journeys in recent days. We strategize and pray about ministry matters in our various houses. We feel the longing of God's heart as we discuss and pray about current events in our nation and world. Closing the evening in benediction, we remember that we are called into fellowship as the body of Christ in order to be given as bread and wine to our neighbors. So I'm curious if there are specific encounters uh, that you could share that have led to transformation in those gatherings. There's so many stories. Um, we've been meeting now at Spring Forest. Well, we've had a community here now for seven and a half years. Our, our, our being an appointment, like our being a new monastic community under the North Carolina Conference, that appointment started four years ago, a little over four years ago, but we had, we were already beginning to meet. And when I wrote this book that you're reading, this was, I was referring back to the, the first iterations of our community during those first years. So there have been a number of stories of transformation. We have, uh, we're very open and inclusive. We're, uh, we're fairly progressive theologically, but we're a practice-based community rather than a dogma-based community. So there are people in our community here both the, the residential community and our dispersed community, there's a, that would range from conservative to very, very progressive or even not Christian. We have some folks that identify as spiritual, but not religious. And um, so it's a motley crew here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there've been several people in the last four or five years who um, began to come and participate in one thing or another that we're doing. We have a small regenerative farm we support refugee resettlement and we have programs for kids and um, some different things. And, and we also have some folks here, myself included, who are trauma informed. So we, we're finding more and more people coming to join in with us who have significant trauma of different kinds, but particularly religious or spiritual trauma from having been um, subjected to abuse by a, a church or another religious organization. So, I have, I, I don't want to betray identities of people because these are people who've experienced trauma, but there've been several people who've come from the queer community, who've come from uh, like super right wing, almost cult like purity culture backgrounds, domestic violence, um, a background mm -hmm. of significant trauma because as a child, their parent died from suicide and that parent was very religious. And then the mixture of the suicide of the parent and the religion and all these things resulted in a lot of acting out and painful consequences uh, in the family. And for them, uh, welcoming them uh, each as forming loving friendships with them with no strings attached has been foundational. And uh, we try to eat together as much as we can. Table is one of our parts of our rule of life here. And so eating together, growing food together, helping refugees learn to read and speak English together, tending the goats together, walking in the forest and identifying mushrooms together, going on crazy trips to get frozen custard together. <laughs> Just this sort of day in and day out of life together with no pressure has created space where everybody belongs, like truly belongs, where people know and are known, are free to tell stor their story, where there's an, a spirit of non-judgment and, and welcome and compassion. And so in this space, gradually, over a period of years, I've seen several people come out of profound brokenness who now are leaders, uh, are now have a capacity to serve others who love God. Um, their language might be a little different than we might think, but <laughs> that's, that's kind of what's happening here. <laughs> And so the table fellowship is a central piece of that, uh, growing food together, harvesting the food together, eating the food together, sharing the food with people who don't have enough food together. Uh, these food practices that are in my heart and mind, Eucharistic practices, 
uh, these become the means of transformation where God's, as Wesleyans, we would say God's sanctify, uh, justifying and sanctifying grace are being made manifest. That's awesome. That's beautiful. Well, for me, the, the chapter on fasting was important. Mm-hmm. I um, have had fasting as a part of my uh, disciplines all my life and uh, e- even outside the Lenten season. And so just to read that yeah. chapter and especially the way you explained it too. And one of the statements you said in here too, that you know, fasting prepares the whole person, uh, body, mind, and spirit to carry out the missional purposes of God. Mm-hmm. Um, you said another statement too, and, and I'm going to give you sort of a, a two-part question. Uh, and you said fasting is the primary spiritual discipline that brings us back to our vulnerability. Fasting returns us to our dependence upon mm-hmm. God. And so I want you to sort of explain that, what it, what you mean by the primary spiritual discipline, mm-hmm. about that vulnerability and a, a dependence on God. But then two, I want you to sort of talk about maybe your personal feelings on why fasting is maybe sort of a lost discipline, mm-hmm. and, and especially among us today. Let's begin with the great canonic hymn of Philippians chapter 2. Let this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was equal with God, did not consider equality something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. And you know the rest of the song. This is one of the earliest hymns of the church. So the mind of Christ already is inherently about giving oneself away, emptying oneself, like pouring out. Fasting is a practice of of pouring out Mm -hmm. in one way or another. Whatever kind of fast, there's an element of giving up and giving away. So far, so good. So there's that piece. And we could spend quite a bit of time and reflection about that. I just want to jump to a couple other things. That this is this, uh, this posture in life of having open hands, of an open heart, an open refrigerator, an open pocketbook, wallet, (laughs) Denmo, <laughs> but this is a this is a fundamental part of being a follower of Jesus is to is to have this posture. When we fast, we choose we choose to become empty. We choose to give up something that normally sustains us, that normally fills time, that normally fills our bodies. Uh, whether in the book I've talked I talked about some different ways of fasting. Today, we are very aware of uh, food relationships with food that are dysfunctional for people who are, you know, who have anorexia or bulimia, that kind of thing. So for some people fasting from food or people that are diabetic, for example, fasting is uh, from food has to be approached carefully. And it's not for everybody um, when people have these kinds of uh, challenges. But when we when we fast from technology, when we fast from uh, some things that are habitual parts of our lives that fill us up, make us happy, keep us, you know, help us to keep going, uh, we're giving up something like that, and and it creates an awareness of emptiness that in our culture is very uncomfortable, especially for middle and upper middle class people. Now, uh, really, people who live in grinding poverty go without a lot of things all the time and Mm -hmm. oftentimes go without enough food. I think about one in four children in this country, if my statistics are right, are are malnourished. They don't have enough uh, nutritious food, for example. But for Mm -hmm. many people, we can't stand the thought of not being full when we want to be with what we want to eat or what we want to listen to or what we want to watch. So in in our particular culture, fasting is a painful discipline. But how else are we going to learn about our creatureliness if we don't have to give up? And the more power we have because we have money or prestige or privilege for various reasons that we're privileged people, the less likely we are to understand at a deep experiential level what it is to be without. Um, so So going without is a discipline that's hard. Now, most of the world People regularly have to go without things that we would consider necessities. So, but you ask about this culture, so I'm that's where I'm going. Yeah, with this, this culture. culture. Right. In Henry Nowen's book, *The Way of the Heart*, where he's talking about silence and solitude, he's, he, he's talking about the solitudes that are not chosen, as well as the ones that are chosen, where we are suddenly forced into a desert-like environment. I mean, speaking metaphorically, of course where we are now without, we're now without the scaffolding that helped us feel right side up. 
And, and I mentioned this in the chapter, I think, about Jesus in the wilderness and Jesus' fast in the wilderness. And so, so whenever we're forced into an unchosen fast, an unchosen solitude, by illness, by a betrayal, by getting fired, by some tragedy or some uh, disaster, there are lots of things that can force us into an unchosen fast then that what happens is spiritually what happens is we run into these same questions Jesus wrestles with in the wilderness like who am i really what is my identity what is god's identity and in this struggle we'll find religious voices surfacing within ourselves that sound pretty convincing that try to throw us off yeah. but the big question that gets wrestled with during fasting and during these unchosen whether the fasting's chosen or unchosen but I'm going to say, especially unchosen fasting, the big questions have to do with identity. Who am I? Why am I here? Who is God? What the heck's going on here? What is God up to? What does God want from me? Those are the questions ultimately that surface during fasting. And if we can structure some fasts in our lives that we do choose, we can begin to develop muscle around fasting so that we're ready to actually engage those questions when they come up. That's great. No, thank you. So the five means of grace are things that all of our churches talk about. And so I'm curious, why would you say many United Methodists, broadly speaking, have gotten away from these practices? The formation in spiritual formation for people in United Methodist schools of theology in the last 50 years or so, I would say, spiritual formation in the curriculum for most schools, especially for university-based schools, uh, research universities and that that have a school of theology. It's been kind of like, um, well, what do we do with spiritual formation? How do you grade people on prayer? You know, on the sort of, we don't know. So, uh, and in a secular university environment, even though it has a Methodist name to the university, there's still this sort of pressure, you know, to be not too spiritual <laughs> in terms of curriculum and things like this. Um, so spiritual formation has tended to be marginalized in the curriculum, and it has been done well by some people who are leading groups and not well by other people leading groups, and it hasn't played a central role in how people are formed in the United Methodist culture and ethos, spirituality, and so on when they've been in many of our Methodist schools. And now, because of that problem, the, uh, that there was, a, there was a lack in sufficient formation in spiritual formation, which ought to be central. Soul formation ought to be central to how we think about discipleship and how we think about uh, theological formation for people to be in ministry. So the Academy for Spiritual Formation was created, um, I want to say close to 40 years ago. Are you all familiar with the Academy? That was created so that people could have a robust two-year experience in spiritual formation, learning the history and practices of Christian spiritual formation and what they have to do with actually living our faith. And so the academy played a very important role for many United Methodist clergy in particular um, to make up for the lack that they'd had. But I think that the overall, that, that's another piece of the puzzle. Like if a pastor hasn't been formed with spiritual formation at the center of their understanding of what they're to be about in the world, then they're not going to teach that from the pulpit and then their leadership. They're going to bring what they have been taught is really important, such as preparing well for your sermons and, you know, knowing how to do the church budget, and, you know, whatever they've been prepared for. So that's a piece of it, too. I think another piece of it, and then I'll stop because this is a long subject, but <laughs> another piece of it really goes back to the early, like the late 19th century and early 20th century, where... Um, there was this uh, resistance in the established Methodist church to anything that felt too emotional, like that's for the weirdos. And so the, that's when the Pentecostal groups started coming out. They were called the, mm -hmm. the Pentecostal and the holiness people, the late, late 19th century, mid to late 19th century. They were called come outers because they were coming out of the Methodist church and they were forming the church of the Nazarene and a whole bunch of other little denominations. And then Pentecostalism came out of all of that, sort of another movement that came out. So United, well, it wasn't United Methodist yet at that time, but Methodism, proper Methodism, wanted to distance itself from all that emotional stuff. And if you want to read a really good study about that, I recommend Ann Taves, who's a church historian, Ann Taves, T-A-V-E-S. 
And the title of the book is Fits, Trances, and Visions, Religious Experience <laughs> from uh, the Wesley's to William James, I think is the subtitle. And it's, an, it's a very insightful book that explains really how Methodists became suspicious of being too enthusiastic. And so, so we've let all that Holy Spirit stuff go to the Pentecostals and Charismatics and uh, out of fear of snake handling and whatnot. And, <laughs> and it's too bad. It's too bad. So part of the challenge now that we're facing, and this is what really motivated me in writing this little book, is how can we cultivate a healthy relationship with the Holy Spirit, like with the whole Trinity, not, not just with Jesus and God, but the, the Holy Spirit, because how can we keep in step with the Spirit, which Paul tells us to do, and be about God's work in the world? How can we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church if we are functional atheists about the Holy Spirit? <laughs> you know, something that I've noticed over uh, the course of my ministry is that there are many local churches that don't have any sort of practice, whether it's pursuing justice or, or spiritual formation. It appears as if the practice is going to church on Sunday yep. morning, and, and that's the gist of what many people do. How do you think we can reintroduce the importance of practice? You know, that that's essentially what it means to be Methodist, you know, hence the term methods. Uh, yes. But where do we start with that for people who have been raised in the church and have been limited to attending worship as their practice mm -hmm. of faith? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we've had our imaginations colonized by the idea that church is a building that you go to or going to church means you go to that building, you go on Sunday morning because God doesn't show up fully until Sunday morning at 10 or 11 o'clock. And then God goes home and takes naps after 12, right? <laughs> so you go there and it's mostly a spectator sport. You have a preacher and some singers. They may or may not be very good. You maybe uh, have some children's programming that happens at the same time, or you may not, but it's, it's this, it's the Sunday morning kind of almost a consumer activity. And uh, when you are the pastor in these kinds of churches, there's enormous pressure on you to perform, to make a good impression and to try to keep getting those people in those pews on Sunday morning and putting money in the plate so you can fund the whole thing. And then what happens is uh, the sermon, which is important, we need sermons, but it becomes a sort of pinnacle of everything that happens on Sunday morning. It's all about the sermon. The imagination is not at all engaged. With what, what does it mean to be a community? In fact, um, the formation of community, which is probably the central thing that people need to be learning how to do in seminary today. That's, that's not even in the curriculum for most schools. How do you form yeah. a faithful Christian community? That's a skill set that requires a lot of spiritual grounding and scriptural knowledge and all kinds of things, but it's not, it's not, it hasn't been considered an important item in the curriculum for most schools. So part of what we have to do is break open the imagination about what church means. And the more attached people are to their church building, stained glass windows, the pipe organ, grandma's name on the plaque by the door. The tougher this is going to be to open imagination, I've found it helpful to take people to on field trips, take your leaders on field trips to places where that's not the case, where the church is fully engaged in the neighborhood and just, and just blow their minds and let them talk to people and find out how did that happen. I'm not sure what's happening at uh, the in um, Indianapolis, it was the church that Mike Mather was at. I'm not sure what's happening right now, but that's a place I used to send people to have their minds blown because it was changed by community organizing. And then there's a church in Columbus called, I think, the church, People's Church. That's another one that's... The Church for All People. Church for All People. That's another one. I could give you a list of these kinds of churches. but So, so taking your leaders on field trips as part of your overall leadership development strategy so that they can have their minds blown. You gotta blow the mind. And once they've exposed enough to things that are already happening that are, that are demonstrating what this looks like, they'll begin to lose their appetite for fake church. And so I'm calling fake church, this idea that church is the building and it's the little things that you have to keep doing in the building I and mean, it all becomes self-justifying because that's an expensive building. So, <laughs> so there's this whole thing. So that's, that's part of it. As you're introducing people to thinking this way and having some preliminary conversations, 
it's easier if you do it during Advent or Lent, because for a traditional church that's used to doing something during Advent and something during Lent, you can bring in some small groups to do some spiritual practices and introduce a rule of life or introduce um, missional thinking. There, there are ways you can bring these ideas in in a less threatening way and get your small groups together and have them eat soup and bread and meet on Wednesday nights at several people's homes so that they get out of their usual setting. If you, yeah, homes, have them meet in homes. So they're like, wait a minute, this is really amazing. We're not in a church building and we feel the Holy Spirit. Who knew that could happen? You know, kind of. Mm -hmm. So, so I've done that before myself mm -hmm. and I've encouraged people to do that for a long time. The book Five Means of Grace is a book that could be used that way. I wrote another book that might be helpful to you called God Unbound. It was published by Upper Room. Uh, the subtitle is um, Wisdom from Galatians for the Anxious Church. Huh. And it's uh, showing how the Holy Spirit is doing a new thing. There's a new re uh, reformation happening. We're at the front end of it. And it's huge. Uh, it's huge. The way uh, the new reformation was happening when Paul realized that Jesus was Lord and had this dramatic experience and then had to come to terms with his own history and traditions. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a reflective reading of Galatians with missional and formational intent. And it's just a little thin book. It's perfect for small groups for a few weeks. And it has reflection questions at the end of each chapter with the, the sort of arc of it resulting in, in uh, helping a congregation be ready to start thinking about new ideas and new ways of being the church in the neighborhood and getting out of the building and out into the street and reimagining the real meaning of church. Can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing uh, with... Sorry. Spring Forest? <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Spring Forest is a new monastic community. I've done a, um, a lot of work over the last 25 years in research and writing and, and creating experiments and networking with people around the new monastic movement and around the missional church movement. And I've integrated these two streams of uh, movements with a study of early Methodism and of the holiness movement. So I, I'm bringing these together. And um, so you'll find these themes in most of my books. You probably saw them in Five Means of Grace. So what we're doing here at Spring Forest, this is an intentional community. We have a residential community with three families that anchor well, now four families that anchor our residential community. And then we have a dispersed community. Some of the people are nearby and some of them are far away because we have uh, digital ministries as well as local ministries. We do not have church buildings. Um, our only official church building is a porta potty over at the farm, which we rent every month for, I don't know, $87. <laughs> <laughs> We got that because of our farming ministries and uh, during COVID, which we grew during COVID, our community grew because most everything we did was outside. Uh, we didn't want folks going in the house with little children and no vaccines and all that stuff, you know, to use the restroom. So anyway, so we have, uh, we have, if you think about a Venn diagram, you remember like, and who doesn't love a good Venn diagram? <laughs> so the top circle is our residential community. We have two houses and a tiny house getting ready to build a hermitage. And so there are those of us, I'm thinking how many people live here now? One, two, and five, four, and six, nine. There are nine people living at Spring Forest right now in our various homes and everything. And then, and so the residential community, we have our own rhythms of life and we sort of anchor everything else. And then we have the dispersed community. So there are probably, I don't know how many people now, I want to say 150 or something. If you add up everybody that takes part in potlucks or the CSA or something, and then morning prayer, different things we do online. And then our, our actual impact every year, we added this up and couldn't believe it, but we actually are directly engaged with at least 1,500 people a year, even though our core community is maybe 20 people. You know, That's they're crazy. on the lead team in our core community. There aren't any slackers. There's nothing you can just sit around and watch. Everybody's very busy and involved in things. Uh, we don't have a Sunday worship service because we partner with uh, quite a few churches around the farm and around refugee support and trauma work and other things that we do. So we don't have a Sunday service because we don't want 
other churches to perceive of us as competing with them and we want them to see us as a resource. So we, in addition to doing a number of missions things that I mentioned, and, and the farm, the farm is the third circle and all the things. The farms are a primary way of connecting to the like a 50 mile radius of people with uh, Durham, Raleigh, Durham, uh, Chapel Hill, Triangle area around all sorts of things having to do with natural farming and food production and agritourism and retreats and stuff like that kids farm camp and things. So my dream and vision in um, starting this community with some friends and with one of my former students who's now pastoring in Nebraska, the dream was to create a distinctly Wesleyan, a distinctly Methodist version of a monastic community that was multicultural and multi-generational, that was good to the earth, good to people, and uh, connected across churches and denominations and organizations networked because this is the way of the future and that provided space for people to step in and practice practices together without having to make a doctrinal commitment. Mm -hmm. We have a rule of life, a prayer, work, table, and neighbor. And that rule of life is simple enough. Anybody can remember it, but it's comprehensive enough to take into account all of life. And then we have different mechanisms for checking in with each other about how, how it's going with our rule of life. And the rule of life is actually the way we practice strategic intent rather than strategic planning as far as deciding things we're going to do. So the rule of life is really um, an essential part of what we do and how we do it. And then we have some traditional monastic things like we have uh, morning and midday prayer. We've had evening prayer right now. It's on hiatus. We're going to pick it up again at uh, during Lent. Kind of tough when you're milking the goats or people are putting their children to bed. You know, the 8 p.m. hour is not conducive for most people that have a job and family life and things. But we have morning prayer Monday through Friday, and there are 45 people that participate in morning prayer. We do it on Zoom, wow. and we use a liturgy, and it's utterly transformational. Uh, the morning prayer is the is sort of the, the core, the, the the central nervous system or something of our worshiping life together. So that morning prayer, because it's it's very robust and it sounds like it's a bit like what you're doing with your uh, the community without a building that you were talking about. And then we also have a monthly dinner church, just like the one I wrote about in the book. And usually there are 30 or 40 people there, sometimes just a handful of people. And sometimes so many people, we run out of silverware and trying to figure out what to do. And then we have a whole range of ministries. You can look at our website, springforest.org. One other thing we do that's in keeping with the um, the traditional monasticism is we have some, we have oblates. So these are people that want to follow our rule of life and be uh, accountable for it. And um, so the oblates, we have two groups and they meet monthly for what's actually like a Wesley class meeting. Uh, only the questions are around our rule of life, prayer, work, table, neighbor. And then we have an annual pilgrimage here at Spring Forest that's celebratory and a time of commitment and uh, feasting and uh, teaching and things like that. So there's plenty going on. There are different, lots and lots of different pathways where people can uh, engage in one or more things at Spring Forest without it being a life sentence or too threatening. Um, and then there are degrees of commitment that people can make, just as is the case in a traditional monastic setting, where people can be novices and then can be vowed members. So we're right now we're working on what that would look like because folks are wanting to join, but we want the membership to be life-giving and to actually mean something. So our spiritual formation team is working on that right now to figure out, okay, what's it going to look like here? So that's what we're up to. And I'm the abbess of the community. So I'm the pastoral and administrative leader of our community. That's awesome. Yeah. I think it's there's something beautiful about the level of intentionality when you talked about membership that I, I think that in traditional church, we often ignore. Mm -hmm. There are the membership vows that we all take, mm -hmm. uh, but different people are, are, in, are in very different places and are, are able or ready to do different things, but we treat it all the same, which you know, to me, it somewhat stagnates growth because if the goal is just to become a member, once you're a member, 
you are there. Yeah. I think the question that our folks are wrestling with on the spiritual formation team is we don't want to be exclusive of people. We want to be wildly inclusive, and we are. We are very, very inclusive. And we want um, people to have an opportunity who want the opportunity to make a commitment, to make it more and more of a commitment to give themselves away, to actually live Philippians 2, that canonic hymn. We want people to have a chance. We're thinking of making this an annual commitment that people could make. Mm-hmm. Check with me next year and see if we've come up with our plan. <laughs> but I put this in the hands of our spiritual formation team. I'm not in charge of that. They're doing it. And I feel confident they'll come up with a wise plan. When you talked about strategic intention versus strategic planning, there's something in there that connects to me. Uh, can, can you talk more about the differentiation? In a nutshell, you can make a strategic plan that looks great, sounds good. It looks great on paper. It sounds religious, and there's no involvement of the Holy Spirit whatsoever in the generation of that plan. It's probably going to be influenced mostly by the people who are the most talkative, have the most advanced vocabulary, and the people with the most money who are weighing in. It's problematic for those reasons. It's also problematic because we are in a time of extreme upheaval, rapid culture shift, crazy stuff going on, wars and all the things pandemic, all these things. If we made a strategic plan in November of 2019 and the church voted it in December, well, what are we going to do in March of 2020? (laughs) The whole thing's out the window. And that's just a snapshot of the broader cultural currents that are going on. So there's a problem there. What we have to learn how to do is something that Otto Scharmer, I think it's S-C-H-A-R-M-E-R, Otto Scharmer. This is a secular dude. Well, I think he's spiritual, but he doesn't he doesn't claim his theory is related to a particular religion. He, he, in theory U is the name of his thing if you want to look it up at Stanford. I think it's at Stanford. No, MIT. But anyway, we have to learn how to lead from the future as it emerges. And in the language of Paul, the apostle, that means keeping in step with the spirit. So I've done a fair amount of teaching on, I, I call it coracle spirituality because I'm drawing from the Celtic Christian tradition, the ancient Celtic Christian tradition of the monks being put out to sea in a little fishing, a round fishing vessel, a coracle that has no rudder, has no sails and no oars, and they trust the currents to take them where they're supposed to go. Wherever they land, if they don't drown, they create a new community there. So that's the, the coracle thing. So that is an exercise in giving up control and giving ourselves over to the control of the Holy Spirit. So what we need in order to practice strategic intent, which is what we do here at Spring Forest, is we need discernment practices that are time-tested. So we use the Ignatian Prayer of Examine, E-X-A-M-E-N. If you, are you familiar with that? Prayer of Examine. Mm-hmm. We use a form of that. Show up, pay attention, cooperate with God, and release the outcome where we're noticing what's coming toward us. We're noticing where energy is rising. We're noticing where resources are surfacing. We're noticing trouble coming toward us, opportunities coming toward us. We're noticing doors that are closing and we're having regular conversations where we can, we can name these things and then say, okay, what are the common threads here? What, where are we seeing glimpses of life coming up and energy rising uh, so that we can follow that? And so it's a way of discernment that is very short term, that's extremely flexible, and that gives us permission to try things and fail and not be ashamed. And that gives us flexibility to pivot when we need to. So, you know, when the, when COVID broke out, we had to pivot out of the dinner church in the house. We had to pivot to having campfires with social distancing. And then we had to pivot with some things we wanted to do with refugees and grow corn for them instead, African corn. So, so this sort of pivot, so you can't hold on to your vision too tightly. You have to be willing to pivot. But this, um, so you can teach a congregation, you can teach a group of leaders how to follow uh, the Holy Spirit. You can teach them these discernment practices and you can get the church to uh, switch from the, this old way of strategic plan to strategic intent and you'll find it frees you up to really keep in step with the spirit. And that's when wonderful things begin to happen. Well, Dr. Heath, it has been an honor to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and 
your beautiful transformative stories. It's been such a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a joy to be with you and I, I hope it helps you and I pray God's richest blessings on you and your congregation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much.